Welcome to today's Campaign Legal Center Conversation, How Congress Benefits from Outside Ethics Review. I'm Trevor Potter, President of Campaign Legal Center. Thank you all for joining us today. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Nearly 200 years ago, Speaker of the House Henry Clay stated that, quote, government is a trust and the officers of the government are trustees. And both the trust and the trustees are created for the benefit of the people. Essentially, members of Congress whose work impacts the lives of all Americans are elected to serve the public good, not to pursue their own enrichment or other personal benefits. Two centuries after Speaker Clay's words, they are more relevant than ever after last month's breaking news of the indictment of a senator on bribery charges puts the spotlight back on congressional ethics. Senator Menendez is the second sitting member of Congress to be indicted this year. Although criminal laws are intended to punish misconduct, House and Senate ethics rules are expected to provide guardrails to prevent corruption. But the onus often falls on the media watchdog groups, and other leading voices to call for enforcement of the existing rules and propose more effective guidelines when those rules on the books are not working correctly. One significant area where current rules and enforcement fall short is the U.S. Senate, where Campaign Legal Center has been fighting to make ethics enforcement the norm rather than the exception. While the House of Representatives established an independent nonpartisan entity to transparently investigate alleged misconduct 15 years ago, such a body still does not exist for the Senate. Instead, the Senate handles all ethics matters in-house, resulting in an opaque system of self-policing that is rife with conflicts of interest. Today, we will be discussing how ethics rules are enforced in both chambers, the creation of the independent body that currently conducts ethics investigations in the House, and what it might take to establish a similar system in the Senate. At this point, I will hand things over to Eric Cashton, Campaign Legal Center's Senior Manager for Legislative Strategy, who will serve as moderator for this discussion. Eric? Thank you very much, Trevor. Now, before we start today's event, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items. During the conversation, please use the comment section on Facebook or YouTube to submit questions for members of our panel. At the end of the panel, we will start the question and answer section, and although we would do our best to get to each question, in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer every one, and we thank you in advance for understanding. If we are not able to answer your question today, and you are a member of the press, please email your questions to media at campaignlegalcenter.org. If you are a member of the public and we are not able to answer your question, please email us at info at campaignlegalcenter.org. Now, let's introduce today's panel. First is Kedra Payne, Vice President, General Counsel, and Senior Director for Ethics at Campaign Legal Center. Kedra specializes in government ethics, lobbying law, and election law. Prior to joining CLC, he enforced legislative branch ethics rules and standards of conduct as Deputy Chief Counsel of the Office of Congressional Ethics, where he was one of the office's first investigators. Next, we're joined by former U.S. Representative Mike Capuano of Massachusetts. Congressman Capuano has served the public for more than 45 years. After 20 years in Congress, nine years as mayor, six years on the city council, 
in eight years as a lawyer and lobbyist in Washington and Boston, his experience in government is second to none. During his time in Congress, Representative Capuano served on multiple committees, including as the chair of the Special Task Force on Ethics Enforcement. We also have Danielle Caputo, Legal Counsel for Ethics at Campaign Legal Center. Danielle works on our ethics team, holding elected officials accountable, ethics violations, and proposing stronger ethics laws and rules for every level of government. Prior to joining CLC, Daniel worked as the Legislative and Programs Counsel at Issue 1, where she advocated for ethics and money and politics reforms, as well as on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Finally, joining us is former U.S. Representative Christopher Shays. Congressman Shays represented the 4th District of Connecticut from 1987 to 2009, a moderate Republican, socially progressive and fiscally conservative, Representative Shays had a strong and successful record of reaching across the aisle to address our nation's problems. He was the primary author of the laws regarding congressional gift bans, lobbying disclosure, and campaign finance reform. Thank you to the members of the panel for joining us today as we discuss the merits of the Office of Congressional Ethics, also known as the OCE, and examine the ways in which an OCE for the Senate could be established. Finally, before turning it over to questions, I want to take a moment to note that today's discussion mirrors a new report that Campaign Legal Center just released on enhancing ethics enforcement in the U.S. Senate, which is available on our website for anyone who wants to read more. CLC's new white paper comprehensively breaks down each chamber's ethics procedures and demonstrates how the OCE has helped increase transparency and accountability in the House of Representatives. In doing so, it supplements today's event and makes a written case for why the Senate should immediately create its own independent committee for ethics investigations. With that, it is time to start our discussion. Beginning with Danielle, can you talk about what ethics enforcement in Congress currently looks like? What happens when a member of the House is suspected of unethical conduct and what role does the OCE play? Absolutely. So Basically what happens is the OCE is the body that first begins the investigatory process. So um, the OCE can either, you know, start its own investigation based on something its staff or board member discovers, um, or so the member of the public can um, basically write in and say, hey, we think that there's this bad behavior happening. There's an allegation of misconduct. And so they start with a preliminary investigation. They start that investigation. They look to see if they think that there's a reason to believe that a violation may have occurred. And then they move to the second step after that happens, if they find a reason to believe. Um, next, they look again, they look more deeply um, and they say, okay, you know what? There's a substantial reason to believe. After that, um, the board will vote to determine whether or not this is going to uh, be recommended that the House Ethics Committee takes a closer look. So this is really the first step where you have the, the House Ethics Committee actually being involved um, with the OCE doing all of the investigation process beforehand. And so from there, um, the House will receive the substantial reason to believe they'll receive the file that ex you know explains everything that OCE has found. And um, the House will then determine uh, whether or not they believe that there should be an additional investigation by them um, because there might be some enforcement that is necessary based on what, what OCE has found. So they will then um, impanel an investigatory subcommittee. The subcommittee will review. After that review, it will go to another committee, subcommittee, um, that will basically look at all of these findings and determine whether or not um, there was a violation that occurred and if there needs to be any sort of disciplinary action, which can range from a letter of admonition uh, all the way to uh, a recommendation for expulsion, which would then be voted on by the full house. So um, it's a longer kind of process. It's very detailed. There is a lot of emphasis on the investigation and all of that really starts uh, with the OCE. Thank you, Danielle. Um, does anybody else want to comment on that first question before we dive a little deeper? Well, I'll just say that uh, one big part of that process is that the report and investigatory findings of the OCE are released to the public. So as that long uh, process is going through uh, its different courses, you do have a required uh, publication of the findings so that voters can see what the OCE has found and make their own uh, conclusions on uh, the, the matter. 
that, that's a great point because that transparency in this overall process that Danielle just summarized looked very differently in the House as of about 20 years ago. So uh, turning to Congressman Capuano, uh, could you tell us a bit about the impetus and the reason for OCE's creation in 2008? Was it a specific scandal, a series of scandals? And what, what was the goal? Well, in 2006, uh, Democrats took the House back in the election. Part of the campaign they had was to drain the swamp, which I think that phrase has now been used by a lot of people uh, in D.C., some of whom mean it, some of whom don't. Um, but the Democratic leaders at the time, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, meant it. Um, she, she put together a panel, of which I was the chair, uh, to review how to go about doing this. And we, one of the first things we looked at, the most important thing we looked at is bringing outside entities into the process for the first time in history. Uh, prior to that, uh, all ethics matters have been handled by members of Congress about members of Congress. Uh, there was no outside uh, involvement at all. I, I want to be clear. I mean, there were, there were complaints made by the public, but the, the ethics committee did take into account public reports or public comments, uh, and they could start their own investigation on it. And still can today. They don't have to wait for the OCE. Uh, not that they do, but they don't have to. Uh, all that being said, at the time, there was uh, some political difficulties internally. The uh, the leaders, the Republican and, and Democratic leader of the Ethics Committee, uh, they weren't getting along very well, uh, hardly speaking. And under the rules of the House, I think rightfully so, the Ethics Committee is limited as to what they can say about any ongoing investigations. So that on a regular basis, there was not a single commentary about any uh, particular investigation going on. Uh, and at the end of 06, I think it was, uh, the most most egregious one was, was a representative in Florida who was accused of uh, abusing young interns at the time. And people like me got very upset because I couldn't even look at my constituents and say, don't worry, the process is going on. It's going to be handled in the normal course of events. I couldn't even tell them there was an investigation going on, whether there was or there wasn't. I wasn't even told as a member of the House. Um, a lot of people got upset by that, and, and that was the impetus uh, for the special uh, task force and the, uh, the result of it, which was the creation of OCE. Fantastic. So OCE has shed a lot more light on the various ethical breaches by members of Congress, the ones you just talked about, but also more recently, failures to file timely stock trading reports, the acceptance of improper gifts, the misuse of official resources. And it's OCE's transparency is showing us a lot about what's going on, you know, when this potential misdeeds in Congress. Do you all think that voters and the general public have benefited from this increased transparency? And if so, how? I want to be real clear. I mean, when you get a group of type A personalities, which is what the House of Representatives is, you, you can't be anything other than a type A personality and get into Congress. Uh, you're always going to have some people who cross the line. Uh, it's just inevitable. These are very aggressive people. We all are in different ways. Uh, so, and, and our life is living as close to the line as we can. That's what. That's how you get to Congress. That's how you be successful in many different ways. Uh, all that being said, there's always going to be somebody who crosses the line, some of whom might put a toe over it, and some people may just ignore the line altogether. So that, uh, But since the creation of OCE, I haven't heard any complaints, particularly by organizations such as yours, that watch these things closely. I've heard no complaints about the lack of transparency in Congress. Some people can disagree with the outcomes of, of certain decisions. I understand that. But there have been no complaints that I'm aware of uh, about the process and about the fact that Congress did handle uh, a given allegation reasonably appropriately. Again, people can disagree on certain outcomes, uh, but they'll know why and how it happened. Uh, that was not the case before the creation of OCE. So most importantly, people can rely on the fact that there is a process for when people violate uh, the ethics rules that uh, is probably going to take care of the situation. Congressman Shays, do you have anything you want to comment on with the questions we've had so far? Oh, sure. Uh, first off, first off, I, I want to acknowledge that what Mike did was very significant. Um, I don't think the general public understands, but when we talk about three separate branches, what we're talking about is one branch can't interfere with the other branch. And we learned this when we tried to, in 1995, the Congressional Accountability Act, we put Congress under all the laws that had been exempt before. And I just illustrate the point that laws like sexual harassment, employment, and so on, 
And then we had to set up a separate office to oversee it because you can't have OSHA uh, tell Congress what to do. So we had to almost create an OSHA office within. But what Mike did is he brought in outsiders that could investigate members of Congress. And he rightfully didn't allow them to set the penalty because only Congress can set the penalty with its own members. But this was controversial. And a lot of public didn't want, uh, a lot of members didn't want any interference from an outside group. So think of it. You now have this ethics committee that can look at and then highlight and then force in a way the embody that the ethics committee within Congress, the members, to have to deal with it. So, and let me just say the importance of this, a democracy that uh, is corrupt ceases to be a democracy. Um, and, and so e corruption is a, a huge and important issue. And uh, thanks to CLC that uh, they continue to focus on this. I'll make one last point. If you don't look at something, if you don't look at something, then nobody knows. And the best way to protect a member by other members is simply to just not look at it, ignore it. And then it doesn't come up to be dealt with. This ethics uh, commission committee outside forces Congress to have to deal with the issue. So hats off to what was done in 2008. Yeah, I wanted to just uh, second that. I mean, I saw firsthand as one of the first investigators for OCE how members were not ready or welcoming to an outside body coming in to ask questions about uh, their, 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 their records, their um, campaign activity. Uh, it may even include uh, allegations of, of things involving their spouse uh, that were connected to Congress. And that was just something that few people were open to initially. However, when the OCE started to work and the uh, public started to see the um, quality of the investigation, started to see the um, uh, information that, that had been hidden before and didn't be able to make up their own mind as to whether or not they thought there was a problem. I think that the OCE started to uh, at least get more uh, um, uh, cooperation, even though that's an issue now, but more cooperation from the members. And uh, let me just make another point, though. On the other side, when you're in a race, your your opponent can make a horrible charge, um, and and that's why there has to be some sense that, that may be totally false, but an attempt to win an election. So. Uh, the, the ethics groups have to make sure that they're not playing into a political rhetoric that is just simply false. Thank you all for that. Um, so we, we've been talking about uh, the procedures uh, for Congress, but when we've been saying Congress in OCE, what we've really been talking about is the House of Representatives because there is no OCE or the Senate. So let's let's turn to that chamber and, and talk a bit about the current process in the Senate for reviewing accusations of ethnic misconduct and how it compares to what the OCE is doing. Sure, I, I'll take that. With the Senate, the process is a lot different without the OCE. Uh, and the main difference is that the lack of transparency for what they do, which then makes it seem as though it is not as meaningful and as effective as the OCE. So uh, where the process starts is similar to how Danielle explained it, where the Senate Ethics Committee can either take information from another senator or uh, an employee in the Senate or from the public. And that information goes to the staffers and they can decide uh, whether or not there's enough information to start an investigation, which they call a preliminary inquiry. That's when it starts to become a black box because that investigation by the staff will have uh, a report and I have a recommendation that goes to the committee members, but there's no transparency of that report. So the uh, committee members uh, decide from that uh, report whether or not it should go to the next step, which is to have an adjudicatory process to determine whether or not there are any consequences for the conduct. But if that committee decides that there's nothing to see here, that they dismiss it, then that report, the findings, et cetera, are never revealed and the public doesn't know what, what, what happens. I, I think the best way to understand is, this is to just- is, is that internal staff that does that? It's That's internal right. staff, employees, 
in the Senate. Well, just you can just imagine the pressure that can mm -hmm. be put on a staff member. It's not that they are going to necessarily be um, asked to totally change the information. They just may be asked, hey, don't look at that. And if they don't look at that, they don't get the information that is needed to know the legitimacy of the complaint. That's right. That's right. And, and the, the data shows that that may be something that's going on. In 2022, uh, the annual report from the Ethics Committee in the Senate says that they had 22 uh, investigations and 21 of those were dismissed for either being de minimis or for not having to show a violation. But then one found a violation, but it was uh, it resulted in a letter of reprimand to the uh, senator that was private. So out of 22 investigations, the public has no visibility as to what happened, who was involved, uh, any facts on the nature and therefore on the matters. Therefore, they see these headlines about things going on. They don't hear anything about what just happened. And then they wonder, uh, well, is this really being taken seriously? So for 15 years or so now, the, the House has had this structure for outside ethics review, and the Senate hasn't. And uh, let's dive a bit more into that comparison then. So how have we seen the OCE uh, increase not only transparency, but accountability, enforcement compared to the OCE in the Senate? Uh, and, and just really, you know, looking at the two uh, next to each other, what would you say are the accomplishments of OCE uh, that compare it to the Senate's less transparent process? Sure. I think one of the starkest examples that I saw um, in our enforce enhancing ethics enforcement report um, that you mentioned earlier, Eric, is um, that the OCE has done a really great job um, showing how nonpartisan it is. And I think that having that nonpartisanness is kind of fundamental um, and part of the reason why, um, you know, there, there have been kind of attacks on OCE, but at the end of the day, the results are kind of very um, clear that they are inherently nonpartisan. So um, anyway, the provision, that the, the part that you talk about in the report says that OCE has referred exactly 52 Democrats and 52 Republicans to the House Ethics Committee for further review. Um, that's, you know, I don't think was intentional. I don't think that they'd say, okay, we're going to do a one for one, but it really just goes to show that this isn't, um, you know, witch hunt for any specific party to try to um, you know, make a partisan show of ethics violations. Um, and I think OCE has also really contrib contributed to the culture of transparency, um, which we've talked about a lot. Um, and what Kedrick was saying earlier, part of its mandate is requiring these reports to become public. Um, and there are very few exceptions to that. And I think that that really helps show, um, you know, exactly what they're doing and why it's so important. I just want to jump in and add a couple of points of information. Uh, the OC is made up of an equal number of Democratic appointees and Republican appointees. There is no advantage uh, to one political party or the other, number one. Number two, even to initiate a preliminary review requires at least one Democratic appointee and one Republican appointee to ask for that preliminary re review. That The whole idea of that is to prevent and avoid uh, any allegations of witch hunt. You, know, you can't say, oh, the Republicans are only changing and chasing Democrats or vice versa. It requires one Democratic appointee and one Republican appointee to even begin uh, the process, uh, which I think has really, uh, again, minimized any potential allegations of, of witch hunting or political bias or any of that. I, again, I, in 15 years, I haven't heard any uh, complaints of that at all. I also wanted to point out, too, as far as enforcement oh. goes... Go ahead, Congressman Chase. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say uh, what Mike and what happened in 2008, you know, establishing uh, this office uh, is a wonderful example of why the Senate should do the same. And the fact that the Senate hasn't done the same uh, is unfortunate. And uh, as a, if I was a member of Congress, I wouldn't be telling the Senate what to do. But as someone now reflecting no longer part of just the Congress, uh, it's just imperative that, uh, and I think that the Senate should duplicate what Michael did in the House. So that leads to the question of, you know, 
and we talked a bit about this, but why haven't they? Uh, if, if the OCE is working, if there hasn't been complaints about it, and uh, the Senate has a shown lack of, demonstrated lack of transparency, um, why do we not have a similar body in the Senate for, for anybody who wants to come? Well, I, I'll just suggest that it's the same reason why the House didn't do it for a number of years, because they didn't want it. And it takes leadership uh, to force the issue. And that's what happened in the House. Uh, and Nancy set up a committee to do it. Um, and uh, so it, it it wouldn't have happened otherwise, because why would members want it as a general rule? Uh, just means one more thing that they might have to deal with that could be very harmful to their reelection. And I think we will see if the way Congressman Capuano described, if the events of different uh, scandals may start to push uh, something to happen. Uh, we see with the recent development of uh, the senator who's on an indictment, but you never know what else may pop up and end up being the straw that breaks the camel's back and hopefully uh, push some reform. Let me just tell you the one disappointing thing I think that's happened on the House side is that some members simply haven't agreed to cooperate. And to me, uh, there's no excuse for their not cooperating. Um, there is a legitimate bipartisan group looking to see if something wrong has happened. And a member shouldn't fear uh, participating. And the fact that they don't seems to me to be something that results in sometimes the failure to get information that the committee needs in order to recommend it to the, the House Ethics Committee. And that, that's becoming a big problem. Uh, CLC did a study to see if there's been a trend with non-cooperation uh, over the past 15 years of the uh, OCE. We see that it has increased over time. The non-cooperation has in increased. And we do think that there should be some way to discourage that uh, non-cooperation, even if there's a, a system put in place where the non-cooperation triggers the investigation to become public sooner so that they're de uh, not as they, they, they turn away from using that tactic. But I agree with what the Congressman Shays is saying is that uh, you should cooperate with this investigation. And uh, it doesn't even make a lot of sense le from a legal perspective because many of those cases end up with the OCE taking a negative inference and therefore transferring that case to the Committee on Ethics for uh, saying that there is evidence of a violation simply because couldn't connect all the information needed. But I, I want to be clear that in the OCE report, in the, in the rule itself, it specifically states that the OCE is empowered to take into consideration the lack of cooperation and to include it in their report, and they oftentimes do. And I will tell you, as a member of Congress, no one wants to read that you're being in, uncooperative on a uh, on an investigation by the <laughs> It's, I mean, the average, it may not mean anything legally, but it certainly means something to the average member of the public that, you know, you seem to be hiding the ball when you've been accused of an ethical violation. Um, again, you know, so I mean, it, there, there is some, there is some degree there. I also want to be real clear. I, I know that some of this is driven by the recent allegation about one senator. Um, that senator is being investigation, investigated by the United States Justice Department. Uh, that hasn't changed even with OCE. When the Justice Department has somebody in their sights, both, I won't speak for the Senate, but the House has always and still does, they'll make a comment that says, look, we're not going to interfere with the Justice Department's review. We're going to put our ethics investigation on the shelf until the Justice Department is completed. For the very simple reason, the Justice Department can put you in jail. All the Ethics Committee can do is kick you out of Congress. Uh, and, and we all kind of know that. They have a much larger uh, tool shed to go to, to get people to cooperate or to investigate. And everybody knows that. So that I actually think that in this particular case, the one that might be driving the discussion today, uh, the ethics, any ethics committee is going to say, while the Justice Department is doing this, we're going to put our review on the shelf and we'll wait to see what they come up with. So um, we've been talking a bit about some of the ways that uh, OCE um, still has some areas of improvement that some people on this panel think, you know, uh, we have to be looking at. But one thing, perhaps the most important thing we ought to make clear to our audience is that OCE is actually not permanent. Um, and it faces attempts to change or dismantle it completely uh, every two years or so because 
OCE was actually created by an internal House rule, not a law. And so that means it must be renewed at the start of every Congress. Um, so let's talk a bit about what that means for the fate of OCE, what uh, attempts have been made to try to change it or even get rid of it, and, and what we can learn from that. Congressman Capuano? I mean, the first couple of years were um, interesting in that every, for the first two and a half years, four, three years, whatever it was, uh, the new Congress, somebody would try to kill the OCE. Um, it was done by some Republicans, and it was done by some Democrats who wanted to just defund it or do it or basically gut it. Uh, and th uh, the truth is, the public demand for it uh, was so loud that uh, it kind of both those attempts failed miserably. Um, and even a member of Congress who may not want the OCE were afraid to vote against it, uh, which is probably a, a good thing. Um, as far as today goes, I couldn't agree more. It would be it would be helpful if it was a more permanent uh, body uh, that was that was didn't have to be reviewed. To some extent, again, I'd, I'd like to think, and it's hard to say, but I'd like to think that they've been around long enough and have a long enough track record that it'd be political suicide to uh, try to cut them out. But I don't want to find out the hard way. I, I I do agree that it would be better all around if it were in a more permanent basis, like a statute. So um, I, I'm going to somewhat assume that that is an uncontroversial opinion on this panel, uh, that everybody would agree OCE should be permanent. Um, so if we were to be looking at you know uh, ways to uh, enhance OCE and to create one in the Senate, what would you say are some of the other recommendations you might have for how to implement a comprehensive ethics structure in the Senate that can build on OCE, learn from OCE, and ensure that Congress as a whole is held accountable? I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, Kendra. No, go ahead, Daniel. Um, I was just going to say, I think one of the biggest lessons for the Senate to learn um, in their attempts to create, um, you know, an independent ethics body um, is that once it's created, kind of to your point about having an independent, um, having it be independent, but also not having it be passed by law, is that um, you can't just assume that there will always be that same momentum to keep it going forever. Um, and while we have been uh, very lucky, I think is um, a way to put it in that, you know, the public really cares about this issue. And every time there's even a whisper, um, you know, people immediately take action and make their, their thoughts and opinions known. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it won't go away. And so definitely, I think that, um, seeing all of these repeated threats through Congress, eventually something is going to slip through. So I think that that's really one of the biggest things in the Senate consideration is one that um, <clears throat> it took a lot of momentum for the OCE to be created to begin with, right? Um, you know, Representative Capuano is saying that in 2006 is when they started talking about it and, and they started looking into it and advocating for it. And it took another two years to, um, to make it and put it into creation and, and make it um, a body that is actually in effect, but um, you know that momentum isn't going to continue to come around regularly. Um, and so, by making it a law and removing that big obstacle, I think is incredibly important. Um, and so, I think that that's one of the biggest takeaways for the Senate is when you do have that momentum, you need to take action and make it permanent immediately because the political will to you know overturn a law is going to take a lot more and be less likely than just to get rid of an internal rule. You know, I, 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 I'm inclined to jump in <laughs> by saying um, we all know that democracy is fragile, but there are many ways to make uh, the OCE ineffective. One is you don't fund it. Two is you put, and Mike, is it four Democrats and four Republicans or three Democrats and three Republicans? I'm not hearing I, you. If you get Kendrick, my, Kendrick, my, yeah, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's, Four and four, however, there's an alternate uh, for each one. Right. Uh, so it's three active and then two alternates. Okay, well, but, but the bottom line is the, they need to be effective. They need to be willing to have a little courage once in a while. I mean, there, there are gonna be some marginal issues where, uh, or someone's so important that they're not sure that 
they want to make life difficult for that person. So, I mean, it requires a tremendous amount of courage, ethics, financing, um, uh, putting good people on it. And uh, frankly, in this day of Trump, uh, we have a whole group of people uh, in this country who, uh, frankly, don't care about ethics, don't care about honor, don't care about a number of things that they need to care about. So uh, it, it, as Mike points out, statute would be helpful, but you still got to be incredibly alert to making sure that it continues to function. And uh, and frankly, that's one why, reason why CLC has its work cut out for it, because it's a constantly, even if you had a statute, it's no guarantee it will work well. Any last comment on that question before I open the floor to some audience questions? Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, we will open the floor uh, to members of the audience who may have questions for our guests. Um, and we'll see if any questions uh, pop up. Here's one. Question from New Mexico. Does OCE have any authority to issue subpoenas outside of the House Ethics Committee? I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, they do not have subpoena authority, and that's one of the reforms that we think is necessary with subpoenas for third-party witnesses, not so much for the members of Congress, but for the third-party witnesses, such as the companies, corpor uh, corporations, lobbyists, organizations that are outside of Congress that have evidence and witnesses that are uh, linked to some activity that happened with a member of Congress, uh, you need to have that subpoena so that a, a third party can frustrate and block the whole process. Does the House Ethics Committee actually have that authority? They do. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see if there's some other questions. Another one from New Mexico, from the New Mexico State Ethics Commission. Uh, we are wondering how the speech or debate clause constrains the OCE's investigations. We confront analogous issues with the New Mexico Constitution. I can take that one too. It, uh, it doesn't impact um, Congress, which is OCE, uh, asking for information. So if OCE goes in and needs emails, files, uh, needs to interview the uh, member or staff. There's no uh, um, defense or, or pushback based on the speech and debate clause. Can you define speech and debate clause for the audience? Oh, yes. Under the speech and debate clause and overview here is that a member of Congress can't be uh, prosecuted for something that they are doing within the confines of their job. Uh, so the most obvious thing is if you say something on the House floor, that can create some liability for uh, for you where the executive branch typically is what you're worried about, comes in and uh, says there's something uh, that you've done and therefore uh, they can come in and take different records, files, because it's so related to your functioning as a member of Congress. So this goes to separation of powers. But when you have a, a body of Congress, so that is the OCE is independent, but it still reports up through the ethics committee. So if it's an internal body asking for those same documents, uh, or, or information, you can't claim speech and debate because it's not outside of that branch. Yeah, I want Before to you the speech and take another clause, question. I, yeah. The speech and debate clause Go on, Mike. wouldn't impact an ethics issue. Um, it might impact a criminal investigation, depending on the issue. But even then, um, it wouldn't stop. If you commit a criminal act, such as uh, directing in a money inappropriately, um, <laughs> That the speech and debate clause is not going to protect you. Um, that's really there to make sure that if I get up there, I want to call Chris Shea is a terrible person that that he can't sue me for calling him a terrible person. But if I get up there and say I can't do that, um, <laughs> yeah, well, you can, but you're going to lose because I'll be protected by the speech and debate clause. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really <laughs> the limit of, of the speech and debate clause to a certain to, to for all intents and purposes. Michael said something earlier uh, that I, I, I just want to emphasize, and that is, you know, we care what people think about us. Um, so when he was talking about, you know, the concern that people would know that a member isn't cooperating, uh, that's not helpful. 
I, I want to kind of use that as an opportunity to say that um, there are a hundred different ways a member could be tempted to do something wrong. And I, I told my staff that they could shut down the office uh, if they thought something wrong was happening. Not unlike what the Israelis do uh, in Israel. They allow a lieutenant, a low-ranking person, to shut down the whole country if they think their country is being threatened. And so what I did was I, I, I told my staff, one, they could shut it down. The other thing I told them was, we're going to use the community meeting test. If I can't defend it in a straight face, totally comfortable, I better not do it. If I can't defend not doing it, I better do it. If I can't defend doing it, I better not do it. And and um, so uh, one of the things, to, in a way, there's a little bit of an irony, but if members know that there's a little more care in what they're doing, they may just be more careful not getting caught up. And, and candidly, you can get caught up in a little thing that gets into a bigger and a bigger, and then you think, oh, my God, what have I done? So um, I was helped once in a while with my staff saying, boss, what are you going to say in a community meeting if you decide to go to the Paris Air Show uh, when you're not on the, uh, on the uh, transportation committee or, 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 even, or, or particularly the aviation subcommittee? How are you going to defend it? Well, that's an easy thing. I ain't going to the Paris Air Show. Now, that's not an unethical thing but it, it, it relates to conduct. I, I want to be clear too, that if people think that a lot of the ethics violations are, you know, people having cash stuffed in their mattress and all that kind of thing. Most of the allegations that came across the desk, are, are, they're not that kind of stuff. They're gray areas. They're not the black and white stuff that cr clear criminal activity. Uh, it's mostly the gray things, you know, really should I have gone to dinner with, uh, with Chris Shea as well? Look, I've known Chris for 20 years and you know, he's been my friend, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of it, most of it is in the gray area and it gets really difficult to, uh, to ascertain. I will tell you that in the 20 years I was in Congress, I had several conversations with my staff and other people saying, well, what if, if I do this exactly the kind of things Chris said, what do I say? What do I do? And even then, some, at least, hey, I'm going to do it anyway because it's legal, it's ethical. And I know some people will like it. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't like whatever it is a member of Congress does. Uh, but that's not the measure. The measure is how do you feel about yourself and how do you, whether you feel comfortable or not taking an action. Uh, but there are a lot of members that also don't even think of it in those terms. They just cross the line without even knowing it. Um, and, and there is a difference. I think that and it should be treated differently between a, a, a relatively small violation that maybe you didn't do intentionally versus something that you, you should have known better. Um, and I think OCE has actually helped distinguish those relatively minor events from the major events. I, I think that's been a good thing for Congress uh, and, a, and a good thing for the general public. So we, we did. We haven't that. talked about stock. And but let's take questions if you got questions. Uh, well, we have one question to answer um, that I believe we got on YouTube. Uh, if you could add one additional tool to OCE's toolbox, what would it be? Well, I guess my, my first um, instinct would be to talk about third-party subpoena, but Kedrick already talked about that. So um, I will say that I think that one of the things that, that I would definitely add to their toolbox is um, if a member refuses to cooperate, which we also briefly touched on, um, oftentimes what we've been seeing, as Kedrick mentioned too, that we've been seeing an increase in the lack of cooperation. And... Um, what this has the effect of is even if um, OCE uses that as like, okay, well, this is a negative, right? And, and we're taking this as an indication that maybe not something's not quite right. Um, it goes to the house ethics. Um, house ethics can um, basically delay as they're doing their own investigations um, for up to 90 days to release the report from OCE. Um, and so oftentimes what we see is that a member will uh, basically be like, well, I'm not going to bother talking to OCE. And if like I have to be subpoenaed or have a, the conversation with House Ethics, um, they might delay as they're doing this investigation. Um, and so they kind of just push back as far as they can um, the publishing of this report by basically stonewalling. And so it, ins it almost incentivizes this sort of bad behavior in a way. Um, and so 
the tool um, is essentially if they do stonewall and they refuse to cooperate with an OCE investigation, um, immediately after OCE makes a recommendation um, that their report would become public so that the, the public can see immediately that they that they were stonewalling. And so it kind of gets rid of that um, incentive to kind of ignore OCE in lieu of waiting for the House Ethics Committee to, to do their investigations. I, I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be totally against it, but I wouldn't be arguing for subpoena power. Uh, the Ethics Committee in Congress has it, uh, but I would be strongly advocating that non-cooperation by any witness uh, should be publicly known uh, when they file the report. Uh, I think that would be helpful in getting some to cooperate. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Shays, I believe before we ask this question, you were just asking to talk about stock trading. And I think that's a topic that CLZ would love to talk about. So uh, and, and let, I, was, I was just going to say that um, I'm not pretending I had a lot of money to invest, but any time I had money to invest, it was only in a mutual fund. And um, because if the stock goes up, anybody can criticize you for. So I was just playing it safe. Um, but uh, candidly, you could be at a public hearing and you could say, my God, this company's going under, this company's moving forward. It's public. But if you acted on it, uh, they'd say it was kind of like, quote unquote, inside information, um, when in fact, uh, anybody could be aware of it. And so, um, uh, you know, <laughs> my, my point is, sometimes as a member of Congress, you, you've got to deprive yourself in some cases of the opportunity to make money uh, because somebody will say it was because you had some kind of advantage when you, you really didn't. Anybody who paid attention to the hearing or read the newspaper might have uh, come to the same conclusion you might have come to. But so, having said that, I think any transaction should be public. Uh, any major transaction should be made public. So that's one of the ethics issues that there have been a lot of chatter about in the last few years, congressional stock trading. But maybe as a final question, we can talk about how stock trading and, and the law surrounding it both need to be reformed and how they relate to OCE and the ethics enforcement process. So maybe Kedrick or Danielle can, can kick us off and then close us out with that. Sure, sure. Uh, Congressman Shays touches on a, a very important point, which is, any stock trading of an individual stock by a member of Congress is going to potentially have the appearance of a problem, even if there is no problem at all. And that appearance of a problem chips away at the public's uh, trust in the government because they just assume that uh, if you traded that, uh, you uh, had some inside information or there was something that you knew that others did not know. And what we found with this issue becoming so big following the pandemic is that the OCE was the only body that enforced the existing Stock Act. So the Stock Act applies to all three branches of government, uh, definitely the House and the Senate, but it's only at the Office of Congressional Ethics where you have members violating the Stock Act by not uh, reporting their stock trades when they happen, waiting sometimes a year later, and they wait a year later, and it looks as though they waited a year so that they wouldn't fall under public scrutiny of, of, of controversial stock trades. OCE looked into this and then created a report that I think benefited the public because they looked and saw that the problem sometimes is just the members don't understand the rule. So that's in their favor that there actually needs to be clearer rules and training on it. But also they looked at some, it looks as though some people may not really uh, be taking the time to pay attention to the rule. So they can't just say they don't know it, but they really are not taking it seriously. That public report that went into detail uh, I think helps shed light on what the real problem is without the public having to guess of what's really going on, which is what you see in the Senate, where you had even harsher allegations of insider trading uh, by a few senators back in 2020. Thank you, Kendrick. So time has flown by. Uh, we only have 10 minutes left. So uh, we're approaching the end of the discussion, and I want to give everyone a chance to leave us with some final thoughts. And if you want to make any predictions, uh, ideas on how a new ethics structure in the Senate could be possible, if that's something you'd like to talk a bit about. Um, so I'll, I'll kick it to Kedrick again, and we'll do a few minutes for each of you before we close out. 
Okay, I'll just briefly say that uh, I think that the points that the congressman have touched on today are very relevant. And you see from just events that are going on uh, currently with a lot of focus on the headlines when it comes to Supreme Court ethics, but then people don't realize that you still always have this bubbling issue with congressional ethics. And in the history of the OC and how it was founded with uh, different issues and different scandals happening, you see that it takes the leadership from uh, the Senate to push forward, but you have this model that should make it a lot easier. So I hope that this, the timing now is one where ethics will be the focus, not only in the uh, judiciary, but also in Congress, and that we will take advantage of a blueprint that seems to be something that works. Uh, I'll just go in order of my screen and say, uh, Congressman Caprano. I don't know what your order of your screen is. Um, uh, thanks, Eric. I, first of all, I, I appreciate CLC keeping a, a spotlight on all this. Uh, I, I do think that absent a, an egregious offense or allegation, uh, most people don't pay a whole lot of attention to ethics uh, issues in Congress, yet I think they're critically important. Um, look, Congress deals with the most important issues of the day. Uh, it's always controversial. This is not new that it's controversial. It's always controversial. There's always deep, important, and, and, and philosophical arguments going on that scratch at everybody's emotions. Uh, and the first time somebody gets an opportunity to think that somebody that doesn't agree with them is also a bad and crooked person, that's not only bad for that individual, it's bad for the institution. Uh, it's bad for America and it's bad for democracy as far as I'm concerned. Um, again, people don't have to like everything that every member of Congress does. Every member of Congress is not a saint. But honestly, I will tell you that most of them are very, very, very good people. Uh, there are some people who make mistakes and there are a handful of people who intentionally uh, break some rules or laws. But those are the exceptions, not the rule. And I actually think that transparent ethics enforcement helps the rest of us look like we're doing our job. Again, you don't have to like what I say on an issue, but at least you know, at least I, I'm speaking the truth as I as I see it. And then I'm arguing to make America a better place for all of us. Um, and, I, and I really think that the, that the OCE has been a massive improvement uh, over the process that we had before. Um, I, I think transparency doesn't hurt anybody. It can be uncomfortable on occasion, but for those of us who enter the public realm, we know we're giving up a certain degree of our privacy. It's part of the, 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 the deal you make with the public is you give me this job so I get a chance to sit there and argue with these issues. And I will give you a little bit of glimpse into my own personal private life that I wouldn't normally do. Um, you know, where the line is, that's a fair question. But when somebody makes an allegation against me, I want the ethics process to be quick. I want it to be, to be transparent. And I want to get over it. Number one, if I've made, if I had a violation, my violations are never going to be big because I'm not that guy, but I'm not perfect. Maybe I crossed the line and didn't know it. Maybe I had a stock sale that maybe I shouldn't have done, even though I'm not a stock guy either. So I, I get that, but you can explain that to the average person. It was a minor thing. I screwed up. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Um, but at the same time, I also, as a member of Congress, it was important to me to be able to look people in the eye and say, look, there's a process. It's transparent. You will know what's going on. And you can and you can feel comfortable knowing that the world will know what happened in this instance, and we'll find out. I think OC has been a great uh, advancement. I think it's proven itself over 15 years. I think it's less controversial today than it once was, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of the, of the small role that I had in, in doing it and bringing it to fruition. And I'm I'm really proud of the job that they've done uh, in, in the last 15 years. And again, thank you to CLC and others for trying to keep a spotlight on this whole situation. Thank you. Thank you. So let's do, um, uh, have Danielle speak and then Congressman Shays can close us up. I'd like to, um, I guess, end just by saying, um, as we've had this whole discussion, uh, the idea is really based on the fact that voters have a right to know that their lawmakers are being held accountable for ethics violations. Um, the infrastructure to protect the public's trust already exists, I think, in OCE and while there may be a few improvements that we think could be made, um, I really do think that, that that infrastructure is there and strong. And um, what we just need to do now is have Congress make it permanent and extend it to the Senate. So um, I just want to align myself with absolutely everything that Michael said um, and maybe just highlight a few points. 
we care what people think about us. The worst thing that someone could say about me was that I was unethical. They could say they didn't like my vote. They could say a whole bunch of things, but uh, it would just pain me no end to think that anyone would think that I somehow was in Congress caring more about myself than the general public. Uh, but I also care what they think about Congress. I care what they think about the Senate. I care what they think about the Justice Department. I care what they th think about the ethics in the executive branch. Uh, because I want, first, I want them to deservedly care. Uh, but uh, if they don't, their faith in their government, their faith in democracy just is obliterated. And if that happens, um, who knows where we end up? So, um, you know, hats off to CLC for uh, focusing on this issue and so many other issues. And um, your work will always be there. And um, I just would encourage the audience to recognize that there are some really crazy folks in Congress, but um, Mike kind of alluded to it. I met some of the finest people I've ever met in my life serving in Congress. Uh, they were workhorses. Sometimes they were show horses, but they were top notch. And then there were some that aren't, but they don't represent to me uh, the vast majority of people that I served with in Congress. Thank you. And, and thank you to all of our speakers for participating today and for your work to strengthen congressional ethics laws. And, and thank you to the audience for, for tuning in. Uh, as a reminder, and thank uh, you, I want to thank your staff. I thank Michael, but I want to thank both all three of you for what you did today. That you've done a great job. Thank you, thank you, and thank you to our audience. As a reminder, uh, a new report that mirrors today's discussion is available on our website, www.campaignlegal.org, if you want to learn more about this topic. And if you have additional questions or want any more information, please email us at info at campaignlegalcenter.org. Thank you, everybody, again. Enjoy the rest of your day, and please take care.